Good evening. Welcome back to Valley Baptist Church. Let's all stand and sing that hymn, Just Over in the Glory Land. Hymn number 413, or look up here at the screen, Just Over in the Glory Land, hymn number 413. I've a home prepared where the saints abide, just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, just knowing the happy angel band, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand. Just over in the glory land, I am on my way to those mansions fair. Just over in the glory land, there to sing God's praise and His glory share. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand. Just over in the glory land What a joyful thought that my Lord I'll see Just over in the glory land And with kindred saved there forever be Just over in the glory land Just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band Just over in the glory land Just over in the glory land There with the mighty host I'll stand Just over in the glory land with the blood-washed throng, I will shout and sing, Just over in the glory land, Glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King, Just over in the glory land, Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band, just over in the glory land, just over in the glory band, there with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in the glory land. Thank you, and you may be seated. Amen. Amen. You all sound like a bunch of Pentecostal Baptists tonight. See? <laughs> Well, that's an exciting song, isn't it? <clears throat> because it reminds us <clears throat> of our future in heaven with the Lord. And why don't, now we mentioned that earlier this morning, didn't we? How wonderful it is to be able to gather together here and sing and worship the Lord. And uh, but how wonderful it's going to be. We can't begin to imagine, can we? And down here is just a little taste of what heaven, eternity, is going to be like with Jesus Christ. Somebody said down here it's like <clears throat> dipping eating a spoonful of gravy, and one day we're going to jump in the gravy bowl, amen. I guess that's, a, that's deep theology, but you pray about it. You'll get to understand that later. But uh, we can't begin to imagine what it's going to be like. We do appreciate you being here tonight. <clears throat> it's good to have Brother the Lundy family. Brother Lundy's the uh, uh, youth director, I guess, up at Marlbrook Baptist. They had homecoming today, and and, you know, they used to call it dinner on the ground. I don't know. Y'all still call it that? And, and uh, so there's no service there tonight. Appreciate you all being here with us. Kind of a real privilege. And others of you who may be visiting with us tonight, we certainly appreciate you being here. Matter of fact, we have one of our missionary families here with us, and I'll, we'll introduce them in just a moment. But we'll have prayer, first of all. But we do appreciate It's great to be able to assemble together again. Amen. Continue to pray for those that may not, may not be doing well right now physically or whatever trials and difficulties you may be praying for someone in the church family. We definitely need to continue to pray for our nation, our leaders, 
I, I did check the calendar, and uh, I believe it is five weeks, if I checked it right, five weeks. I said six weeks this morning, and uh, it, it's... it's uh, how many of you believe it's five weeks from Tuesday? <laughs> Somebody get a calendar out. It's, it's, no, Judy Jackson. Now, we argued over that at lunch today. It is not. It's five weeks from this Tuesday, right? Uh, church tre the church treasurer's right on everything. He controls the money, right? <laughs> Somebody get, anybody got a calendar? How many weeks is it? From Uh, I, I said it's five weeks. <clears throat> I said it's five weeks from Tuesday, and that's correct. The pastor is always right. <laughs> now, visitors, we're having a little business meeting here. Y'all just, uh, <laughs> we y'all y'all welcome. Okay, all right. So, uh, I know you said six weeks. You know, she. She needs to sit over here on the blue ribbon side where the liberals are. I tell you, that does sound like a politician trying to wiggle out there. Too. Well, anyway, it's November the 3rd, right? November the 3rd. And sometimes we laugh to keep... What's that? Okay, well, that's the way. Yeah, And I know who you voted for, I'm sure, amen. But anyway, pray. We laugh to keep from crying sometimes. But we do need to pray for our leaders, not only the presidential election, but locally, statewide, and then the appointment to the Supreme Court. Boy, we, we really do, our heart long, we just want God's will to be done, amen, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pray about that and other things on your heart. Let's pray together, all right? <clears throat> our Father, we do thank you for the health to be here tonight, and Lord, we do pray for anyone who's not able to be here, Lord, for whatever the reasons may be. Some may be working, Lord. We pray that you'll just be with them on the job and bless them and use them there. <clears throat> Some may not be able to be here because of physical reasons, Lord. We pray that you'll touch their bodies and <clears throat> may the Holy Spirit minister to their hearts. And Lord, we do th we thank you, Lord, not just that we can come together and fellowship and be encouraged and challenged, pray for one another, and be fed the Word of God. All these things, Lord, are for our benefit. But, Lord, more important than any of that, we are just thankful that we can come together and join our hearts together and worship you and the true and living God and, and know the joy of having a, not just knowing about you, but having a relationship with you through your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, God, we thank you for that. We pray your hand of blessing to be upon the service tonight. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Amen. It is good to have Brother Zach Gillett with us. Brother Jack, you come, and his wife, Ashley, and some of their children, one of our missionary families to England. And by the way, Ashley just happens to be the great niece of, uh, of Shirley Humphreys. Now, I guess you claim John, too, don't you, Ashley? Yeah. And, uh, but we appreciate them, and they just happened to be in Virginia and dropped by, and he's going to take a few minutes tonight. How many of you have never met the Gillets before? You've prayed for them. You've seen their All right, my goodness. That's two-thirds of the church. And you've seen their name on the prayer sheet, the bulletin. You prayed for them. And I'm just glad you get a, a quick opportunity to meet him tonight. And thank God through praying and giving, we have a part in getting the truth of God around the world, don't we? So, brother, you come and just share your heart with us. God bless you, brother. Well, it's good to be here with you all this evening. And I do want to thank you, first and foremost, uh, for everyone who prays for us on a regular basis. There have been at least four or five folks since I've been here this evening, just even before the service, who wanted to let us know that they pray for us regularly. And we're very grateful for that. For uh, the many of you, I guess, this evening that have never met us before, my name is Zach Gillett. My wife, Ashley, is there in the back. And uh, we have three children, Ruth and Lydia, and Malachi is the noisy one uh, back there. And we've been serving the Lord in the UK now for, we're going into our 10th year. And we're very grateful. Uh, the folks here at Valley Baptist Church have supported us for nearly that entire time. And we're very thankful for your faithful support. And um, we were in the area where uh, we just so happened to be visiting our family who lives not too far away from here. And, but we wanted to pop in and give a report to everyone and to thank you for praying, but also to let you know uh, how you can pray for us. And I just want to read one verse from the scriptures 
that I think is very fitting um, for this present year that we're going through in the UK. In Philippians 1, in verse number 12, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, and he says, But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. And we really believe that's the case in the United Kingdom, that everything that's happened in this year, and we've shared many of the same things you've had with the coronavirus and other things, we know and we believe that God is working all of those things out to the furtherance of the gospel. Again, for those who are unfamiliar with our ministry, the work that we're involved in in England is a church planting work. Uh, 32 churches close their doors every other week in the United Kingdom. There's hundreds of empty church buildings all over the country. And there's a great need, uh, just like in the book of Ezra, when they went back to Jerusalem and they rebuilt the temple. They're, that's essentially what's being done in the UK now, not just by Americans, but by others as well. We're rebuilding a work that was once great in that part of the world through church planting. Amen. And God's been gracious to us. We, this year, we will uh, have, we will be, we're being seen our sixth church plant. And that's our, actually our first church in the country of Wales, which we're really, really grateful for. Uh, I hope you'll pray for that. It's called New Street Baptist Church. They just started holding Sunday services two weeks ago. And we've heard some wonderful reports from the folks that are preaching there on, on every Sunday. They, I think they started with right around a dozen people, and they've had new visitors there every week since then. And we praise the Lord for that. It's an old building. It's about 150 years old. And God's given it to us free of charge. And um, a work is moving forward there. And we praise the Lord for that. The church my wife and I are at, um, we planted four years ago in Birmingham. Birmingham's the uh, second largest city in the UK. It's East Birmingham Baptist Chapel. I hope you'll pray for that church. It was planted in a, in a disused church building that had sat empty for about 12 years and we're in a majority Muslim uh, neighborhood, that part of Birmingham where we're at. It's known as the most radical part of the UK. One out of every eight people who are arrested on a terror offense in the United Kingdom live in our part of Birmingham. Uh, but in spite of those things, God has been so gracious to us. And even in this past year, with everything that's been going on, we've seen a number of souls saved. And we've seen people baptized, added to the church. The church is growing. Um, we, when, the, when we first came back after our, we had about a two, uh, two and a half month lockdown where we weren't able to hold in-person services. But once the first Sunday we came back, we set a limit for how many people we could have in our building. I'm sure you've done the same thing with your building. I know you've sectioned, I see you've sectioned off different parts of it. And we set a limit, a capacity. And we praise the Lord. I think the past... Um, Six or seven Sundays in a row, we've been full to capacity, and many folks have been coming in. We've had new families joining the church. We've had people coming in from open air evangelism. We, we're out in this uh, again. It's the second largest city in England. We're out in the uh, city center preaching the gospel every week, and we've seen a number of people come into the church, want to know more about the gospel, uh, want to know more how they can be saved, and we're so grateful for that. And uh, God's been good. Um, I mentioned that these things have happened to the furtherance of the gospel. We're also in involved in a Bible college. And that, that's really part of the church planning work. If you think about it, we're training people up so they can be sent out uh, to the UK and to other parts of Europe as well and do the same thing and plant uh, New Testament Bible preaching churches. And that's what's being done there. We At Crown Hall, we've had wonderful blessings over the past few years. We had over the past two or three years, we've had our first graduates they have graduated. They've gone all the way through the three-year system, and they've graduated. And now um, four of them, I think all four of our graduates, have decided to stay on and join the staff. And, in fact, one of them is heading up the church plant in Wales. He's a recent graduate, and he's heading up that work and doing a phenomenal job in it. And we praise the Lord for that. But one of the great outcomes of this coronavirus lockdown is uh, you found scores and scores of young people all up and down the country who were off of their jobs and were sitting at home or they were off of university or off of college and they were sitting at home wondering what to do with their lives and many people uh many christian young people started picking up the bible and wondering and praying and seeking the lord and maybe saying maybe these things are happening because god wants me to look more closely into what i'm doing with my life and we found that a good number of people said i believe god's calling me into the ministry and we have this autumn, when we opened our doors a few weeks ago at Crown Hall, we had the largest enrollment of British and European students we've ever had. 
which is amazing. Normally we have students that come over from Crown College in America. None of them have been able to make it this year. And we thought, what's going to happen with the college? None of our American students are there. It's usually quite a good number. But it seems the Lord has made up that number. And then some, we have 11 brand new students, not counting our returning students, who are come. And uh, they come from various backgrounds. One couple, married couple, came and they, uh, let, they, he quit his job in the army. He was discharged from the army so he could come and train for the work of church planning. We have another couple from the Netherlands who they sold their house there in the Netherlands and they've moved to England to be a part of the work there, um, to be a part of the training there. We had a young lady who's joined us from F.B. Meyer's church. If any of you are familiar with the work and ministry and the writings of F.B. Meyer, we have a young lady from his church. And just uh, we have a lady who's a widow and her husband was a minister for many years and he passed away and she thought well i'm not just going to spend the rest of my life sitting around i want to do something for the lord i want to go even though she has much experience in the ministry she says i want to go and be trained and be a part of uh of planting gospel preaching churches and so the lord's really been at work at that and i hope you'll pray for that please do pray for our bible college uh, students there at crown hall Pray for them fervently that God will take them up and they'll be sent. It would be a great thing. They'll be sent all over the country and all over Europe. Uh, two of them have a burden for the continent of Africa. They want to go and be missionaries in that part of the world. And pray that God will take them and mold them into wonderful laborers for him. That's one prayer request. Another prayer request I'd have for you is pray for new church planting opportunities. All of our churches thus far have been planted in empty church buildings that have been given to us free of charge. And one of the, another great thing, at least we believe great for us, that's happened over the lockdown is we've been approached by three different churches um, in different parts of the UK, and all of them said the same thing. They said, we were already planning on closing our church from the lockdown, and, we don't, and now the lockdown's happened, and it's kind of pushed it forward a little bit, and we don't know what to do with it. Would you pray about coming and sending someone to start a church in this building? Amen. And so if we're, we're at various stages of negotiation, and we're work, trying to work through all the legalities and the details um, with all three of those different groups. And some of, all three of them may work out, none of the three of them may work out, but I hope you'll pray for them. And pray that other opportunities through this year, that other church planning opportunities will be made available, and that God will send us the laborers to them. And then I'll give you one more personal request, and then I'll, I'll hand the service back over to the pastor. If you could please pray for our family, especially for our, our youngest child, Malachi. He's here with us tonight, and he was, uh, he was born with a, a very rare uh, defect, and he has, he'll have to have um, a very serious skull operation uh, that, to have his skull reformed and reshaped so that, um, <clears throat> so that he won't have any complications in the future when he starts to grow up. That operation is going to be held uh, sometime after we get back to the UK. We're going back to the UK at the end of this month, and we're, we're, we're still in communication with our doctors and nurses back in that part of the world, and so that'll be happening sometime, we think, around December or January, but we're not quite certain on the exact date. They're still waiting to schedule some of those things, so we'd appreciate your prayers on that behalf, but we're so grateful uh, for this church. We're grateful for your continued stand for the Lord and your continued preaching of the gospel. Grateful to see new faces here that I haven't met. It's always a good thing when you come into a church three and a half years later and it's not all the same faces. Um, that's a great thing. But I hope you'll, um, um, we're grateful for your prayers and support on our behalf. The Lord is at work in that part of the world, make no doubt about it. And we believe that uh, a great reason for that, one of the many reasons for that, is the prayers of God's people in this part of the world and other parts of the world as well. So we thank you for that, and we give thanks on your behalf. Thank you, and God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Zach. It, isn't it encouraging? What a challenge, what a blessing. On the back of that bulletin, I think there's 35 or 36 <clears throat> missionary ministries, and the overwhelming majority of them are uh, families, just like the, the Gillette family. And when you're praying for them, you're supporting them financially, uh, it's, you know, it, it's great to know, you know, Jesus said, I'll build my church, and you're not going to lock him down, amen, it's, a, and God can, I love that scripture reference on the front of the bulletin, bulletin, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God is faithful, amen, and it's just so encouraging, isn't it, folks, to, to know that the Lord's working, and uh, we don't see it in the newspaper, we don't hear about it on the news, but souls are being saved, and, and, and God has his remnant ministering all around the world. 
And uh, we, we appreciate you dropping in tonight. And just that, that's encouraging to our heart. Just a couple of things real quick. We appreciate those of you who picked up these gospel tracts. These are with the election coming up. These are attention getters. And there are many of these laying around out in the foyer. So please uh, pick them up, take them with you. And this is the easiest way in the world to just share the gospel with someone and hand them these gospel tracts. Also, uh, I keep talking about the election. Uh, I think Dennis may have brought some of these with. Uh, this is a sample ballot if you're in Augusta County. Now, if you're in Waynesboro or, or Stanton or Rockingham, Rockbridge, it may be a little different. But uh, I think there's a few of these out on the Welcome Center. We'll have some more by Wednesday night. And uh, this is exactly a sample ballot if you're in Augusta County. Uh, some of you have already voted, some of you haven't, but be sure and pick those up. And also, we, we didn't have time to make copies. We'll have these for you by Wednesday night. <clears throat> this is a, a comparison of the Republican Party platform and the political party platform. Someone asked me personally the question just the other day, how can you as a conscientious Christian vote for a particular person and then started talking about their life? I said, well, sometimes you may, not, you may not be voting for that particular person, not that you approve. I doubt if, I know this is going to shock you, but if you knew me as well as my wife knows me, there's probably things about me you wouldn't like. Now, I know that shocks you to death. Okay, hopefully they're not sinful things, amen. But anyway, but uh, it's the platform. It's what these two uh, parties stand for. We'll ha and, and you, you, we have access to so much information, but we'll print up some of those and have them for you because we do need to be informed, amen. It's not a personality contest. It's voting uh, values and principles and so forth. But we'll have all that for you or more of it. So these, these sample ballots are out on the Welcome Center now. There's a few of them out there. Well, is it good to be in the house of the Lord? You know, man, I've already been encouraged. I'm going to tear up my resignation and just keep on pastoring for a few more weeks, amen. And <laughs> Just joking with you, teasing you and I. We're going to sing one more song. We appreciate Brother Derek helping us and Anna on the piano. And right after this next song, our assistant pastor Tim is going to come and take us back to the book of Revelation. So let's get those hymn books out and just sing from our hearts to the glory of the Lord. And then, Brother Tim, you come and, and share the word with us. Hymn number 398, Yesterday, Today, Forever. Let's all stand as we sing hymn number 398, Yesterday, Today, Forever. Jesus is the same. Oh, how sweet the glorious message simple faith may claim. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. Still he loves to save the sinful, heal the sick and lame. Cheer the mourner, calm the tempest, glory to his name. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never, glory to his name. Glory to his name, glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. He who pardoned every Peter never needs thou fear. He who came to faithless Thomas, all thy doubt will clear. on his bosom rest busy still with love as tender lean upon his breast yesterday today forever Jesus is the same all may change but Jesus never glory to his name glory to his name glory to But Jesus never, glory to his name. Who he made the raging bellows walked upon the sea. 
Still can hush our wildest tempest as on Galilee. He who wept in pain and anguish in Gethsemane drinks with us each cup of trembling in our agony. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Thank you. You may be seated. We need to do that again and just let the kids sing. Amen. That was good. Man, I'm half kidding, but I'm halfway being serious. I'm ready to do it again. Man, that was good singing. They sound like they believe that. Adults, we got to pick it up. We got to pick it up. All right, let's take our Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 4, okay? Revelation chapter 4 tonight. Anybody need a handout that didn't get one? Yet. Anybody need one? All right. I don't see any hands up, so all right. After last Sunday night, I think it was the first thing I went over and said to Anna was, man, I went way too fast in that message Sunday night. And if you were here last Sunday night, we were talking about why do we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture and gave out a handout that had, I think, nine reasons on it. And we got through the first five and we kind of went warp speed, all right? And so if what I'm going to do, I didn't have a chance to put it out there tonight yet, but I'm going to fill in all the blanks on that because several folks came up and said, Pastor Tim, you just went way too fast on that, and we didn't get those blanks. And so I want that to be a help to you. Certainly there's other resources you can go to, but we will put a handout out there with all the blanks filled in, okay, in case you missed them last Sunday night. It is a doctrine, like we said last Sunday night, that we don't have to... Uh, make enemies over, but it's an important truth, isn't it? And it's an important truth because it's founded on the Word of God, and that, as we heard this morning, that has to be our foundation. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 4 tonight, and we're going to pick up in verse number 1 and read. Let's just read the whole chapter. It's only 11 verses, and I'll read out loud, of course. You just follow along silently there with me, okay? Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse number 1. After this I looked... And behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And about the throne, excuse me, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. 
For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Let's pray together, all right? Father, as we look at this chapter tonight, Lord, would you help us to to walk away with the with the right view of heaven? Lord, would you help us to walk away with the right idea of what's important and what will be important when we are in heaven with you? Lord, we look forward to this moment in the future when we are with you in glory. But Lord, help us not to be caught up in the trivial things that so often we hear about and we focus on on earth. Lord, help us to realize that heaven is heaven because of you. And that, Lord, for all of eternity, we will worship you, that we will bow before you. And Father, I pray that that would not just begin when we're there with you, but Lord, that that would be a characteristic, Lord, a a frequent characteristic of our lives here on this earth. So teach us tonight, Father, what you would have us to learn from this chapter, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have ever read a book or maybe just did your own, maybe you did your own Bible study, but you you wanted to figure out what's what is heaven like? That's pretty uh, it's it's kind of a common topic in our culture, isn't it? You can watch movies about what people think heaven or heaven is like. You can read books that are written uh, what people think heaven are like. You can even read books of people who claim that they've been to heaven and came back from heaven and they have kind of a a perspective they want to give. Um, You know what my advice to you would be? You want to know what heaven is like? Go to the Bible. And specifically, go to the book of Revelation because Revelation gives us the most detailed description, the most detailed picture into heaven of anywhere else in the Bible. There are certainly are other passages that talk about heaven, but Revelation is the place to go if you want to see the details. And what Revelation chapter 4 does is it takes us, we've already seen this, right? It takes us on a trip to heaven. Supernaturally, John, verse number 1 says, or excuse me, verse number 2, he says, immediately, I was in the Spirit. This is not something normal, okay? This is God giving John, we know this, a supernatural view into heaven. And, And listen, not just a supernatural view into heaven, a supernatural view into future heaven, all right? If you look back at verse number 1 of chapter 4, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be when? Hereafter, all right? So this is a future view into heaven, all right? Now, what is the center of heaven? Certainly God, we would say God, is the center of heaven. What's the centerpiece of heaven? All right, we gave it away because we read the chapter, right? The throne of God. What's a centerpiece? A centerpiece, if you, uh, yeah, I'm not a decorator, but if you have a centerpiece, it's kind of the, the centerpiece on the table, right? It's supposed to be what kind of catches the attention. Listen, folks, tonight, it is without any doubt from Revelation chapter 4, what we're supposed to think of heaven as and what we're supposed to think of the centerpiece of heaven as, and that is the throne of Almighty God. God's throne is the centerpiece of heaven. It is the first thing that Christ shows John in verse number 2. Look at verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne. Twelve different times in Revelation chapter 4, the throne is mentioned. If you read Revelation 4 and 5, it's 16 times. God is obviously emphasizing this, um, this, and I say this figuratively, this piece of furniture. All right, What's the purpose of a throne? A throne, is it just a nice decorative chair? Does it, is there a purpose behind it? It's a representation of authority, isn't it? A throne is the place from which a king rules and reigns, decrees, gives orders, and even at times, as it is in the book of Revelation here, the place from which the king can decree judgment or 
justice or a sentence upon a criminal. Here's a picture into heaven, and the first thing that we see is the throne, representing certainly the power, the authority of Almighty God. Then letter B on your sheet. Johnny, if you click that play button at the top of that screen, that will take you back to a full, full screen there. Thank you, sir. By the way, here are some artist renderings, all right? By the way, I, I don't think any of these are right, okay? I'm not being any disrespect to the artists that painted these paintings, okay? But these are folks who took Revelation chapter 4 and tried to come up with an image, all right? I think of the scripture passage in the Bible that says, I hath not seen, nor ear hath heard, nor has entered into the heart of man, right? The things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Folks, I am thankful for artistic ability, but nobody can paint a picture that captures the true glory of what heaven is like. In fact, it's almost odd, isn't it? If we're not going to do it tonight, but if you go back and read Ezekiel's view into heaven, even these passages in Revelation, you sort of come away going, what exactly is that? Is that right? Has that ever happened to you? Uh, for, for instance, we're going to talk about this in a minute. These beasts that we see, right? that have eyes in the front and eyes in the back, and there's eyes on the inside. I'm like, what, are we, what am I supposed to imagine when I'm seeing this? And I think John might have been thinking the same thing, all right? But it's a view. John is trying to describe something to us that is impossible for the human mind, and it's certainly in its fallen state, to comprehend. But he's going to do the best job he can, and certainly this is what God wanted us to have from the Apostle John. Number two. Everything we're going to talk about tonight is centered around the throne. Number two, not only is there a throne, but there's someone on the throne. And John describes that image to us in verse number two and three. Look at the end of verse number two. He says, Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he <clears throat> that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. In other words, John sees someone sitting on the throne, but he can only describe it in terms of a um, beautiful shimmering jewel, all right? Now, we are used to having things like this, aren't we? Screens and high definition this and high definition that and... I got my cell phone somewhere. Cell phones with fancy high-definition images. What would have been to John and to any other person living in the time of John's day? What maybe would have been the most beautiful thing that they could picture in their minds? The most um, descriptive, colorful, beautiful, and certainly it would have been precious jewels, wouldn't it? They didn't have televisions and and uh, those kinds of things. but So John picks the most beautiful, descriptive things that he can think of to describe what it is that he's seeing on the throne. And here's the two things that he says about this person sitting on the throne. He says, he was to look at like a jasper and a sardine stone. And you say, well, what does he mean by that? All right, well, take your Bible just for a minute and go to Revelation chapter 21, will you? The Bible tells us exactly what he's seeing when he sees a jasper. Revelation 21, verse number 11. Revelation 21, verse number 11. The Bible says in Revelation 21, 11, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious even like a jasper stone, clear as what? Crystal, all right? So the best way we can imagine what John is seeing when he sees an image like a jasper stone is crystal, right? The, the brilliance, the reflectiveness, the brightness of crystal. And he says also he sees what looks like a, verse number 3 of chapter 4, a sardine stone. Well, uh, sardine was the color of like a ruby to us. Red, so he's seeing this brilliant uh, crystal light flashing from the throne, and, and there's red light mixed into it, and that's the best way he can describe it to us. You say, well, what is he seeing? Who is he seeing? Well, hold your place here and go to the book of Ezekiel with me just for a minute, will you? Ezekiel chapter number 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. 
in verse number 26. Ezekiel has a view, a vision given to him by God, similar to what John sees. But Ezekiel gives us a little more description. He maybe fills in some, some question marks as to what, what are we seeing here. Look at Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26. And Ezekiel says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. And it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the what? Glory of the Lord. And that's all, that's the glory of Jehovah God. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. And I heard a voice of one that spake. Listen, there is no... Um, misunderstanding. There is no question as to who it is that John's seeing sitting on the throne. This is God Almighty, right? This is the glory of Almighty God that John is having the privilege. And, and folks, listen, this is a glimpse, right? This is simply a glimpse. Look at verse 3 back in Revelation 4. He says, he, was, he that sat was to look at like a jasper stone, right? He was to look at like a starting stone. In other words, he's letting us know that this is the only way I can describe it to you, is that God's brilliance and his brightness was shining like the most beautiful crystal, and there was red beams of light coming out of it. In fact, how, does, how is God described when he's uh, seen on the earth? It's light, isn't it? He's, in fact, he's described as a light to which no man can approach unto. Jesus is the express, express image of God. God is not in the form of a man like Jesus Christ who took on the form of man, right? But here's God Almighty sitting on the throne. And the description is of such beauty and such glory that we can't even imagine it, right? In fact, we don't have time to do this, but if we go to the end of Revelation, the Bible says there's no sun in heaven. Why? Because God is the light of heaven. And I think that is literal, folks. In other words, uh, what happens when you shine light through crystal? It reflects. And what do you, what do you sometimes see? Rainbows. Wait a minute. What did Ezekiel say he saw all around the throne of God? He sees rainbows, and that's the only way I can describe it. I'm seeing crystal. I'm seeing red flashes of light. I'm seeing rainbows as the brightness and the glory of God is shining throughout heaven. In fact, that's how John describes it. Look at verse 3 again. Back in Revelation 4. He says, on the throne, he sees God Almighty. But then how about around the throne? Look at verse 3. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto a what? An emerald. All right, you say, well, wait a minute. I thought Ezekiel saw a rainbow like the rainbow in the sky, right? And here John's trying, he says, I see a rainbow looks like an emerald. Emerald is, of course, green. He says, are these, uh, are, these con are, you know, are these conflicting re reports about the throne of heaven? No, I don't think so. These, this is humanity trying to describe the beauty of Almighty God. And folks, listen. I think the takeaway from this is this. Do not trivialize the awesomeness and the awe with which we will stand before Almighty God one day. We're not going to be fluttering around in heaven with wings sitting on clouds. All right, It's not going to be some kind of silly, lighthearted folks. We are going to be bowing before the creator of the universe. A, a, a God that is so great to even when John, who is called up in the Spirit and given some kind of view of him, he can only describe it in terms of color and light. 
And he says all around the throne, coming from the throne, is this crystal and these red flashes of light, which certainly could be representations of the wrath of God that's about to be poured out on the earth. But he says all around about, verse number three, is a rainbow, like an emerald. Now, I was thinking about this this week because you're probably sitting there thinking the same thing, kind of like, man, how do you even imagine what, what John is seeing? And here's the only thing I could think of that, had, that, that is often emerald green with rainbows mixed in. Anybody think you know what I'm thinking of? What are these? The northern lights. Now listen, please don't misunderstand what Pastor Tim is saying tonight, okay? I'm not saying this is a sneak peek into heaven, okay? I don't think that's it, all right? But the heavens declare the glory of who? God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Is God in some way maybe just saying, hey, I want to give you just a snapshot of what John saw in a much more magnified way when he saw into the throne room of heaven. Again, please don't take this and say, Pastor Tim said the northern lights are, that's a view into heaven, all right? That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying this is beautiful, isn't it? And I think in maybe just a tiny little way, it kind of, you sit there and go, wow. What must John have seen when he sees God sitting on his throne? And by the way, what was Ezekiel's response to that vision? Remember the end of chapter one? He fell down on his face. He said, this is too great. This is what John did when he first saw Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. Because all around the throne is the beauty of a rainbow. What else is around the throne? Well, we're told it's not just a rainbow, right? But there's something else there around the throne. Look at verse number 4. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So around the throne there's this, what looks like a rainbow, and then around the throne he sees 24 seats. And by the way, the word seats is the exact same word as throne in verse number 3. So he sees the throne in the center, and around the throne he sees what looks like 24 smaller thrones. And there's 24 elders, is how he describes them, sitting on the thrones. And he says they're clothed in white and they have crowns on their heads. All right, Who in the world is this? All right, Now, some people say, well, this is an um, elevated group of angels who have a very um, special position close to God in heaven. I want to show you tonight, give you real quick, and I have to go through them quickly, five reasons that I believe this is a representation of the church in heaven, of you and me, all right? Let's go through them quickly, okay? Number one, they're referred to in verse number four as 24 elders. Elders, all right? Every single time in the Bible that the word elder is used, is it referring to people or angels? People. It always refers to humans, all right, to people. Now, it does at times refer to um, the leaders in the Jewish nation. At times, certainly in the New Testament, it overwhelmingly refers to the church and the leaders of the church. But ang- uh, elders, excuse me, never refers to angels, all right? Number two. Number two, what are these elders doing? They are sitting. And the Bible says, verse number 3, that they're sitting, excuse me, verse 4, that they are sitting on thrones. You say, well, that's kind of arrogant, Pastor Tim. You think that these 24 people sitting on thrones represent the church? Well, there's a reason that I think that, right? Look at Revelation chapter 2 just for a minute. Revelation chapter 2, verse 26. Revelation 2.26 says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. Look at chapter 5, verse 10 of Revelation. Chapter 5, verse 10. 
This is the 24 elders in chapter 5 singing this. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Look at chapter, all the way over to chapter 20 just for a minute. Chapter 20, verse number 4. Am I going too fast again? Just wave at me if I need to slow down, okay? Look at chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And folks, we could certainly go outside the book of Revelation. There is verse after verse after verse that teaches that those that know Christ and specifically those who serve Christ faithfully will reign with him, have positions of rulership in heaven. Now, folks, listen, that is never given to the angels. In fact, we're told we will rule even over angels. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? So here's these 24 elders. They're referred to as elders. They're sitting on thrones. Look at number three back in chapter four. The Bible describes them as being clothed in what? White raiment. White raiment. I, I, don't, I think I put some verses there in your, in your handouts. If I didn't, I just jot these down. Revelation 3.5. Revelation 3.18. Revelation 19, verse 8. This term is almost always, not every single time, but almost always referring to those who've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And folks, that's not angels. That's you and me who've come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Number four, real quick, what do they have on their heads? Crowns. They have crowns on their heads. Again, angels in Scripture don't receive crowns, but you and I do. Chapter 2, verse 10, Christ told the church at Smyrna, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And certainly we could study the crowns in the New Testament that God gives. And what are we going to do with those crowns? We're going to cast them at his feet. That's you and me that receive crowns. That's those that know Christ. And then fifthly, and I think this is the one that kind of puts the nail in the coffin, I guess, if you say it that way. Look over at chapter 5. Look at the song that these 24 elders sing. Chapter 5, verse number 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So these twenty-four elders represent certainly humanity. They represent humanity who've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ, who've been crowned with crowns of um, reward. And they represent that group who's been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And I believe that's why it represents you and me. Which, by the way, if you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, then you believe there should be something in heaven that represents and pictures the church. And I believe that this represents us. Around the throne is the Rainbow around the throne is the, are the 24 elders that picture God. And then how about this one? What about from the throne? What's coming from the throne? And we see it in verse number 5. Certainly we've already seen this image of light, but look at verse 5. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Now we could go to a lot of places. I, I encourage you to write down this passage, Exodus 16. Verse 19, when God comes down to Mount Sinai, you see the same description. We could go to Exodus eleven nineteen, 19, Exodus 16, 17. And here's the point. There is a, and I'm not sure that these descriptive words do it justice. There is an authoritative voice that's decreeing from the throne. You know, if you think back to the time that Jesus was here on the earth, and Jesus stood before Pilate, and Pilate basically gave him a chance to defend himself, remember? 
And the Bible says, as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so Jesus opened not his mouth. He had came to this moment for this moment. He had come to this moment before Pilate to die for you and me. But folks, listen. Jesus is not here on this earth anymore. And when we come to this part of Revelation chapter 4, God Almighty and the Lamb are not going to keep their mouth closed. This is when God is no longer... Um, when God's grace has, time has really come to an end. And he is going to pour out his wrath, as we saw last Sunday night, upon this earth. It is an authoritative voice, not a humbled man standing before a human king. This is the king of kings and the God of creation on his throne, ruling and reigning the heavens and he will then pour out his wrath and take back this creation that has left him and forsaken him and rejected him. And he will do it with all authority. From this point on in the book of Revelation, every time the Lord speaks in heaven, that will is done on the earth. Remember the passage Dad referenced this morning? We're to pray that God's will will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. Listen, when we get to this point of the book of Revelation, God's will will be decreed in heaven and it will be done on the earth without any hesitation. And so that's the voice that we see coming from the throne. Number five, what about before the throne? What's before it? We've seen what's on it, we've seen what's around it, we've seen what's coming from it. The Bible says in verse five, out of the throne proceed lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. John sees these burning, and by the way, here's the word for lamps, these seven torches burning. This is not the same word used in chapter 1 when the Holy Spirit is described as these seven lamps. These are burning torches that John uses to describe them to us. You say, what's the picture? I believe the picture is this. The same Holy Spirit that is the comforter to those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will be the Spirit of Almighty God that is the, uh, the crusher of those that reject Him. The consuming fire that God will pour on this earth to those that reject Him. And folks, I know this is heavy, but this is what God is warning us of in the book of Revelation. This is God on his throne about to pour out his wrath upon the earth. He says before the throne is the spirit of God who's a consuming fire. He says before the throne, verse number 6, before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Now this isn't an ocean, all right? This is an image that we're trying to a picture, right? If you go back and read Ezekiel's vision, he sees something very similar to this. Can you picture it in your mind? Even just a, a glimpse so you've got this light, the glory of God that's beaming from the throne where God is, is seated. You've got this rainbow around the throne that's, that's, that's beautiful and emerald and all the colors of the rainbow that we think of. By the way, aren't you thankful that God originated the rainbow? He knows, he, he's the one that gave it meaning. And the world and Satan, is, it is a testimony to the counterfeit of Satan that the world has tried to steal God's, and you know what it is? It's God's covenant-keeping promise of mercy on the earth. And isn't that just like Satan? To take something that God says, this is my promise of mercy to you, and Satan takes it and turns around and sticks it back in God's face and says, ha, ha, ha. Well, folks, listen. The God who's shining like a rainbow on the throne one day will no longer put up with that. It's going to come to an end. If people don't bow the knee now, they will bow the knee to this God then. But before that throne is this beautiful sea of glass, which I can't picture anything but this light all just refracting from everything in heaven. Number six, in and around the throne. And I know this is the one you were thinking, man, maybe he'll go over and talk about those beasts. I'm glad we're out of time, so I don't have time to talk about the beasts. No, I'm just kidding, okay? Real quick, in and around the throne. Look at verse number six. And there, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. The four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, 
which was and is and is to come. All right? There are many opinions and perspectives about what these, what does the calf represent and what does the eagle represent and what does the man represent. I encourage you to study it yourself. Partly because we're out of time, but partly because of this. Do not be distracted by the image of the beasts. And this is what happens sometimes when we study Revelation. We, we sometimes get caught up in all of the intricate things and we miss the point. Okay? First of all, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament that when God built the tabernacle, he instructed uh, Moses to put cherubs over the what? You remember? The mercy seat. When the temple is built, and you can read about this in 1 Kings. I'm not sure if I put the reference in your, in your paper there, but it's 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 23 through 28. God says in the temple, I want you to build these, and they were large, these large cherubs, and put them over the mercy seat. By the way, what happened if you entered the Holy of Holies and you didn't come the way God said? You were struck dead, weren't you? The, the best way I picture and can describe the role of these four beasts is these are the proclaimers and, if you will, the protectors of the holy throne room of Almighty God. These eyes that are described, John's seeing these eyes, are, in other words, they're seeing everything. They're looking before and behind. They, in other words, these eyes are alert and they're aware. I think of even to this day, Satan who can enter into the throne room of God and accuse the brethren. Here's cherubs who God maybe has there to stop him from coming, but so far. And I don't want to, go, I don't want to take too much freedom, but here, if you go back and read Ezekiel in the passage about Satan, you know what Satan was described as? The anointed cherub that covereth. Now, we can't be dogmatic about this, but you know it's very possible, and I would even say even likely, that Satan himself was given the privilege of being one of these creatures at his beginning until his heart was lifted up with pride. He was the cherub that covered, described much like these creatures that we see here. But here is the point. What are these creatures saying? What are these creatures doing? They aren't receiving glory. They aren't receiving praise. Verse number 8 says that they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Lastly tonight, let's just look at this and we'll be done. There's something coming from the throne. There's something around the throne. These creatures are, the Bible says, in and around the throne. But there's something going toward the throne. What is it? Look at verse number 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. What's going toward the throne is worship, isn't it? Worship. Not some surfacy events of a church service that sometimes can happen, but true, pure, unadulterated worship of Almighty God. And folks, listen, they're worshiping him. When we get to chapter 5, we'll be worshiping him for what he's done for us. But listen, this moment, they are simply worshiping God because of who he is. The creator, almighty God, who sits on the throne, prepared to enter into a moment in future events that has never existed like any other moment on this earth, when God will through Jesus Christ, take back this earth that he created and every person on it. He will retake his creation, which, has, which fell into sin, and the people which so frequently and boldly and disgustingly reject God Almighty. They say, you are worthy, God. You are the creator sitting on the throne. You can do with this creation whatever you choose. And folks, listen, God's mercy endureth until the moment that he says the cup of wrath is full and the cup of wrath we poured out. And that's why it is so important that we do what we heard this morning, that we take the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel, because the same one who will be the judge died on a cross 
so that you wouldn't have to be and that I wouldn't have to be judged. And not just you and me. So any person who will believe in Christ would not have to be judged. The centerpiece of heaven is the throne of God. And the throne of God is where God Almighty sits. And when we're in heaven, there's going to be a lot of wonderful things there. I know that. But can I tell you what your focus is going to be on? I know we joked a few weeks ago about the mansion. You ain't going to be worried about that. I know we wonder, what is this going to look like? What are these beasts going to look like? Folks, I don't think you're going to be worried about that. I was talking with somebody the other day, and they said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Peter this and Paul that. I don't think you're going to be doing that either. You know what you're going to be doing? You're going to bow down on your knees, and you're going to worship the creator of all the universe. But folks, let's not wait till then to have that attitude about Almighty God. And I think it's just so important in the day and age in which we live. As you and I think about Almighty God, may we get our view and our idea of what God is like from this book. Not from Hollywood, not from some movie. He is not the Santa Claus in the sky. He is Almighty God. And one day, as Ezekiel did and as John did, when we see him, we will fall down. And we will say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, you are worthy because you are the creator of the universe. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. Lord, this image that we look at tonight with John is something that humanly we can't describe. John did did it in human language the best he could in, in the way that you wanted us to have it described. Lord, may we be humbled at what we see tonight. May we be excited at what we see tonight. But Lord, may we be people that worship you. Not because of what you just can do for us. But Father, because of who you are. Father, may we truly fall down. And as the Bible appropriately teaches, may we fear and stand in awe who you are and Lord may that fear drive us and give us the wisdom that we need to live for you each and every day you told us in your word that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom Lord give us fear appropriate understanding of who you are your glory your power your might that we are simply your creation placed here to serve you help us to serve you faithfully this week We pray in Jesus' name. Eyes are closed, heads are bowed tonight. I'm just going to ask Anna to play one verse on the piano. You talk to the Lord there in your seat. Maybe tonight you just want to.